Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club in Hong Kong for another one of our uh, online events. Um, before we get started with this evening's event, uh, a few reminders about some upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, same time, same channel, we have uh, Tech War 2.0, the future of the US-China clash over next generation technologies. And that will feature a panel including Ray Ma of Tech Buzz China, uh, Jenju Scott uh, and Paul Triolo um, of Eurasia Group. Um, and so do uh, stay tuned to that. You can register through the FCC website. Um, we're also very excited to be having uh, in-person events again here at the FCC. Um, this, uh, this Thursday, uh, Harry Harrison, the cartoonist from the SCNP will be giving a, a lunchtime talk. Um, unfortunately, that one is already fully booked, but uh, tomorrow there are still seats available for Dr. Tricia Lee, the Chief Executive Officer of the Hong Kong Sports Institute. And she'll be talking about Hong Kong's recent success at the Tokyo Olympics. Um, so that should be a great session and there are still seats available. That's for lunch tomorrow here in person at the FCC. Um, but, on to tonight. Uh, we're delighted to welcome to the FCC Linda Javen. Uh, Linda has a long connection in Hong Kong, um, going back to her time as senior correspondent for Asia magazine in the first half of the 1980s, uh, and also its first Beijing bureau chief. Uh, she's lived, studied and worked in, in Hong Kong, Taiwan and China, uh, going all the way back to 1977. Um, and she later moved to Australia, where she's since worked as a, a writer, a literary translator, uh, a film subtitler, uh, and is the author of 12 books, including seven novels, two of which are set in China. Her latest book, The Shortest History of China, distills her more than 40 years experience studying Chinese politics, language and culture into an approachable and entertaining account that helps us frame China's history, uh, its place in the contemporary world and where it's likely to lead in the future. Uh, if you have any questions uh, for Linda, you can email them to question at fcchk.org. That's question, singular, at fcchk.org. Uh, and Linda will be speaking to our correspondent member, Rebecca Bailey of AFP. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca and Linda. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for joining us, Linda. It's so good to have you. Um, I'm going to wonderful jump right here. into it. <laughs> I'm going to jump right into it because there's so much to ask you about. Um, we are obviously going to talk about your book, which is fantastic. We've got one cover here. I think you've got a different cover, the Australian <laughs> copy. <laughs> the Australian, you've got the UK cover. <laughs> and this book, you, you literally take in Chinese history from, from creation itself until the present day. So there's plenty to talk about there, but I also want to take advantage of having you to go into some of your own experiences because really you could write a book about your own life. Um, so <laughs> the book, you start with primal chaos and a cosmic egg. You go right up to July, 2021, just a few months ago, and you do this in 250 pages or so. Um, how, how do you even start doing that? <laughs> um, well, before I answer your question, I just want to say it is such an honor to be talking to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Hong Kong. I am so delighted. It really is just an institution that was always very close to my heart when I lived in Hong Kong. Chinese history, how do you put it in 250 pages? Uh, I, I probably cut about 30, 30 40,000 words that I'd written to get it down. And one of the things that I'm sure all of you know is a journalist, when somebody says, give me a thousand words, and you know that they're not going to put in a thousand five hundred, right? And you discover all of the fat in the language, you know? And so obviously it was that. But more than that, I really, um, what I wanted to do as I went along, I realized there were certain themes that stood out. And those themes had to be illustrated. I also wanted to show that Chinese history has the most amazing, amazingly wild characters, really, really interesting um, traditions of thought that are quite important to history, uh, that art and culture are so much part of Chinese history, and that women's stories, which so often get overlooked, needed to be woven through the entire book from beginning to end in a way that I don't think has been done before in general histories of China. So these are the things that I was thinking about. I was thinking, okay, I'm going to lose a little bit of detail here on the arguments 
between Neo-Confucian <laughs> bureaucrats and philosophers in the Song Dynasty. But I'm going to get in this awesome woman here, and I'm going to tell the story of this wild eccentric here because he does represent something in Chinese history that I think is sometimes overlooked. You know, that oh. fun thing, the crazy thing. You know, we, we can't just stick with the emperors and watch how one moves to the next. Although that's important too. That's how, that's how you make history come alive, right? Um, I do want to get into some of those individual stories later on because they were some of my favorite parts of the book. But let's go back to this idea of themes. You say, you say that there are some running through the whole course of Chinese history. Um, I mean, I guess one might be corruption. Um, <laughs> You've got it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you say at the very start, the first empire, the Shang, like they, they, they eventually crumbled because of corruption. And that set a sort of precedent that you see again and again in all the dynasties that came after them. Um, so could you just talk us through that a bit? Well, first, I'd like to say that's not an original thought because that's been the thought of Chinese historians about why dynasties crumble. Um, and they use this to tell a moral tale you know, two emperors, look at the last dynasty, see how corruption brought it down. You must do better. That began with Sima Qian, you know, the, the, the historian of the Han dynasty. Um, we're talking a historian who lived um, 21 centuries ago. You know, this is, he spotted it then. And as you say, the Shang dynasty was one of the first examples of this, a clear example. And the problem with corruption is that it's not just about some people getting rich or uh, some people having more privilege, but what happens is it sucks away resources from the public. And it, it means that the Yellow River, the dikes on the Yellow River aren't maintained and there's floods and people lose their farmlands and lose their lives. It means that there's droughts and famines. It means that there's no upkeep of grain storage you know, for times of famine. It means that the roads aren't being built and so on. So this is when you get rebellions, you get popular uprisings. And I think that one of the interesting things about this theme, as with some of the others, is that to the present day, you can see how it plays out as an obsession. So the first thing that Xi Jinping did in 2012, when he came into power, was launch a very significant anti-corruption campaign because he understands that and never are the corruption and the corruption campaigns are always and they always have been a, a very good excuse too to clamp down on the corrupt people that you don't like <laughs> <laughs> you can kind of protect the ones that you do like you get rid of the ones that you don't like so i think we see that yes shang dynasty to the present day corruption is an important theme and how do people how does it happen you know, how does it happen that a dynasty that starts out as the Ming dynasty did with its very first emperor determined not to ever become corrupt? And then the Ming dynasty becomes the, one of the most corrupt, um, you know, uh, uh, dynasties in Chinese history. So how does that happen? These, these are really interesting stories. Mm. And what about some of the other themes that sort of guided you through this, uh, well, centuries, millennia, <laughs> a long narrative. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say I'll, I'll point out, um, I'll point out two that also have uh, strong resonances in the present. One is anxiety over succession. Um, so the inability to create a orderly, you know, the, the problems with orderly succession um, have haunted Chinese history for millennia. Uh, and through the book, I think you have noticed this stories of as, as um, in one particular case, axe blows in the night, <laughs> you know, and you have fathers killing sons and you have brothers killing brothers and you have everybody's killing everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's, there's a, there's a successor that's chosen and that's okay, but they're afraid that the other person, maybe the older brother, who would believe it was his birthright might get a little bit antsy so they kill the older brother you know just in case <laughs> just in case and so this is this is an anxiety that we see played out today because the communist party 
um, which is organized ac according to Leninist lines. And, and Leninism is a really good structure for a movement, for a campaign, for a revolution. But it doesn't really tell you how to move from one leader to the next with a minimum of upset. And so Deng Xiaoping, as we know, tried to uh, establish, um, under Deng Xiaoping, the party tried to establish these norms of a two-term uh, two limit, and therefore create some kind of institutional structure for succession. Um, and now what we've seen is Xi Jinping has taken that structure and just thrown it up into the air. Uh, and we, we still don't know what is going to happen as a result. And so as a result, there is still, to this day, a huge anxiety about succession. How do you choose the next leader and make it a non-disruptive process? The second theme, which I think is really important, is um, stress over borders. Because China is, uh, it has borders with so many different countries. Um, and it always has had borders with not so much different countries, but different tribal groups, um, different, um, different power structures uh, that existed. They would call them the barbarians. But even, even when it was in English, we, we talk about barbarians. But the Chinese words for barbarians were very specific. So there were, they used different words depending on where the barbarians were. You know, the barbarians of the South and the Southwest were called by different names than the barbarians of the Northeast. So the Mongols and the Cantonese <laughs> <laughs> were different kinds of barbarians. And as China's landmass as, as the as the empire as whatever you want to call it the nation grew so did the problems of having you know you have more countries along your border you have more potential problems mm -hmm. uh, the great wall was a manifestation of border anxiety and an attempt to control the borders and we still see that today you have the great wall of the past you have the nine dash line of the present Mm -hmm. There's always been these attempts to carve out the territory and to fortify it. That's one of the other things about taking this sort of, you know, highway through history in the book is you really get a sort of visual sense of how the borders expanded, contracted, broke up into like different warring states at different parts. If you're talking about history as a narrative, then then, you know, this, this, what you often hear the CCP talk about, you know, an unbroken civilization, that, that's not strictly true, either when it comes to territory or ethnicity even. It's not even true when it comes to government, because there were so many periods when China was broken up, when it wasn't one dynasty, you know, there were so many very, very long periods when it was a lot of different warring kingdoms, a lot of different warring states. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of mythology and myth-making around the subject of, of Chinese history, uh, which mm. is very interesting. And you just have to kind of plow through that and look at what actually was the case. And another, I mean, if we're going to talk about uh, narratives and mythologies, you, you, a, lot, a thing that comes up a lot in the book is the different uh, philosophies uh, of the, the various like grand philosophers of China and how their kind of ideas and maybe the, the morphing of their ideas, how that still persists even in the presence as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think that um, it's, as with art and culture, you cannot separate the, these philosophies from the history of China. Um, and so what I do with the book is um, with every chapter, I think, okay, we're moving forward chronologically in time, but what is the most interesting thing about this period? And there was a period, it was the period of the Zhou. Um, so it was, um, it was just before the first unified state, um, the Qin. Uh, and so the Zhou, and, and I have to point out, this is quite interesting because it reminds me of something you just said in the last question. I have a map here of the Qin and people always talk today, the Communist Party, you know, the Qin, Qin Shi Huang was the first emperor in 221 BC, he unified China, right? But if you actually look at the map, <laughs> I mean, obviously, Xinjiang and Tibet are not part of it. Neither is the Southwest. Neither is a chunk of the Southeast. Neither is the Northeast. So when we talk about 
China, it's a constantly evolving concept. And it's not just this one country with the same shape that we think of China today. Um, but uh, remind me what I was supposed to be going on about. <laughs> uh, the Zhou and the philosophers. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so in the Zhou dynasty, which preceded uh, Qin's unification of China, um, th this was a very rich period because the Shang dynasty had, um, had yielded to the Zhou. The Zhou dynasty began in this really glorious way. According to legend, I think it was 40 years without a single crime being committed in the country because the rule was so good. It was so fair and so just. And it was the rule of, a, of, a, of the, the Zhou, the, the, the clan that was ruling the Zhou. Um, and they had, there were a number of, you'd call them feudal powers, I suppose, local landholders um, who eventually uh, warred with the Zhou and broke off and there was absolute chaos. Into this chaos was born a desire to end the chaos, to end the war. There was suffering everywhere. Um, and among the people who, so a lot of people were thinking, how do we solve this problem? So you have to understand where the philosophy comes from to understand where it then goes. And so the philosophies that grew up during this time wanted to answer the question, how do you rule? How do you rule? How do you rule so that you have a good society, a just society? How do you end war? How do you make things work again? And so Confucius, of course, was, uh, he, he was born about 550 BCE. And um, he, he was obsessed with how do you design a society? How do you design a government? How do you make all this work? And his answers were to look back to that great glorious rule of the, of the Zhou, of the early Zhou, and to say that, that was amazing. Those rulers, they ruled by moral example. They, the society in the, that society, everyone had and knew his place or her place, which was always a little lower than his place. <laughs> and, because, and the prince ruled the country in such a way that was orderly, did it with rites and rituals to enact that moral authority. And then it went down all the way to the family. And so the father, the head of the, 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 the patriarchy, the, the little patriarchy that's the family would then enact a similar thing with rites and rituals, ancestor worship and all the rest, and everything would work. But then others came along and Confucius didn't like the idea of laws. He thought laws were there to tempt people to break them. Why would you have laws? You need moral authority. <laughs> along came a much more practical man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was, um, He's associated with a, a school of thought known as legalism. And that is basically, what's morality? You know, <laughs> um, morality is whatever the current ruler wants. So it, it, there's no such thing as good and evil. It's what you want people to do and what you don't want people to do. So you enact laws that reward and punish behavior. So he was very pragmatic. It, it's a kind of a cynical, you could call it a cynical philosophy. Um, and it's not one that a lot of um, dynasties or rulers since have wanted to embrace openly. But as Jia Jian Ying, who's a very wonderful writer, I'm sure many of you know her, um, she has written about Han Feizhi and called him the, the um, was it, the Prince of Darkness or something of <laughs> Chinese history. <laughs> and she says, she says that um, basically most rulers would, would cloak themselves in Confucianism, but in the core of the way they actually ruled is Han Feizhi, is legalism. And of course, we've got the philosophies of Taoism and, and others that I go into in the book as well. But if we want to take this to the present day and see its relevance, we can see how the Communist Party wants to establish, it needs to establish its moral authority. It is the legitimate ruler because, and its moral story has to do with the century of humiliation. It rescued China from this century of humiliation. It changed the narrative. It made China strong. Xi Jinping has made China 
the strongest. <laughs> and and so you've got this kind of cloakal of the Communist Party is in power because it does the right thing. It's moral. It's 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 got a a, a moral legitimacy to it. Um, and you can even see, I mean, Confucius Institutes, isn't that great? You know, the Communist Party came into being wanting to dada, you know, dada, uh, you know. <laughs> Kung Lao and all this sort of thing. I mean, Kung, you know, it's Kung Jia Dian, all this sort of thing. It was just against Confucianism. And it's now cloaking itself in Confucianism. But if you look at the way it rules, and, and even things like the social credit system, it is very, very legalist. Rewards and punishment. Do the right thing, you get rewarded. Do the wrong thing, you get punished. I guess Han Faisal would have had a field if he could have seen the social credit system. <laughs> Sounds oh, like an sort of ultimate <laughs> realization. Um, just want to remind everyone watching that if you have questions for Linda, you can send them into question at fcchk.org. That's question singular at fcchk.org. I've got plenty, so if you don't get them in early, I won't <laughs> get to them. Um, just one last thing uh, before we get into the, some of the juicy individual stories uh, about the grander themes. The other thing that really stands out is, is just how cosmopolitan and open to the world and, you know, open to the flow of goods and people from all over Asia. China was at, at, at like multiple points in its history. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a bit about, about that. Yeah, it's very, it's a, you know, you look at the Tang Dynasty, and I'm certainly not original in saying this. I mean, it's, <laughs> it is the thing about the Tang Dynasty. But in the Tang, um, you know, people walked around, men would wear uh, Turkish clothing. People like to cook with Indian spices. They played Persian polo. They were very open to the world in so many ways. And the world was open to China. So the world was open to the Tang and the, the Japanese and the Koreans um, took away ideas about tea and about costume. And they took the language as did Vietnam. You know, this is, this is so interesting. China had this magnetic attraction for the world. People came from down, the, you know, across the Silk Road, from the Middle East and Persia, Central Asia, and so on. They came from across the seas, from Korea and uh, Japan, and they came from other places because it was it was it it was a thriving cultural mecca. It was amazing that poetry was something poets were the pop stars of the age. They were people who got tattoos of their favorite lines of poetry done on the on their bodies the you know pop they a poet like Li Bai who always wanted to actually be an official this was his tragedy <laughs> he wanted to serve in the court um and people but he was such a pop star for the people women in uh, you know singers in bars would sing his poetry this is the kind of place it was and it was reasonably well ruled um it was there was uh, a, 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 the, the beginnings of the regularization of the civil service examinations, which brought talented people into the bureaucracy and into the court. Um, the Song Dynasty refined that further, but we've already got in the Tang Dynasty the idea that these examinations to bring in new people to the civil service would happen every three years. You know, so you had this flourishing culture. The emperors encouraged the culture. Women um, enjoyed a rare time of um, relative social freedom. There was this was pre foot binding. Foot binding came in in a small way at the end of the Tang, but women um, enjoyed the freedom. They they were not necessarily socially penalized if they married again. You know, if they had a lover, and so on. Um, they wore wild makeup, absolutely fabulous <laughs> <laughs> makeup and hair and everything else. Um, and I think there's something about that. It's a cultural flourishing. It's good governance uh, and an openness to the world. And that made things kind of work. But the tongue also ended up being 
problematic because of corruption. And it was a beloved concubine of a, of a great emperor uh, who put her, everybody caught, it's interesting in the history books, I had sometimes when I was writing, I had to chase things down because you often will read, it was her brother who she made prime minister. Um, and, and people were objecting to that and they were objecting to the family privilege. And I was like, okay, brother. And then I read cousin. And then I realized that of course, um, in Chinese, uh, you have biao uh, which is a, which uses ge, which is a brother, but that biao ge or tang is, is a cousin, is a first cousin. And in fact, the prime minister that she, you know, persuaded um, the emperor to, uh, to take on was her cousin. Um, but that kind of, she, she was fully invested in nepotism. <laughs> she got, <laughs> She did so much for her family that Du Fu actually wrote a poem um, satirizing the young ladies, the ladies of the young clan who were dripping in jewels, you know, and, and all this sort of thing. Why? Because of the connection to the court. So you did have those problems, but the Tang really flourished and it was, it's still remembered as a great time because it was open. One of the great flourishing open times of China, which is not celebrated anymore, and I wish I had more space to go into it there, was that of a part of the Republic. Mm. So, you know, you had Shanghai, which was one of the great cosmopolitan cities of the world. Um, and people were drawn to it from all over. But of course, there was so much else going on. There was, you know, the pro <laughs> there was, um, <laughs> Rather there, was going on. <laughs> there was a lot going on. There were war lines going on. There was, there was Japanese invaders going on. There was too much going on, the communists versus the, the, the Guomindang and so on. But um, these periods of openness did generate a tremendous amount of culture and, um, um, and, just really interesting ideas, which I think have stayed with us in many ways, or they sometimes they get buried and then they get unburied. Um, you mentioned Yang Guifei there, the, uh, the concubine who sort of blamed for bringing down uh, the Tang. Um, I want to, you, you said in the beginning uh, that you wanted to sort of lift the stories of women and stories that you don't hear so much in maybe some of the grander histories. So I wanted to talk about some of the women um, specifically for a while. Um, when you were writing the book, was there any one woman in particular you thought, oh God, I wish I had a little longer just to write more about her? Oh, there were so many, but I, my, <laughs> my favorite is Tang Chunying, the feminist, the late Qing Dynasty feminist, friend of Qiu Jin, the much more famous uh, late Qin feminist who, ended up being beheaded because she was also, you know, an anti-Qing revolutionary and got caught. But Tang Chun Ying was amazing. She was the daughter of a Qing dynasty general. He gave her a boy's education. And one of the things I discovered that in history, a lot of the women who made it in interesting ways had been given a proper education by their father. So that was an unusual thing throughout much of Chinese history, but she had been given a good education, including in the martial arts. And she went on to study bomb making with Russian anarchists. <laughs> <laughs> she put together an all women's militia that fought in the revolution of 1911. Um, and she was the first member of Sun Yat-sen's revolutionary alliance. So, she was always fighting, obviously, to get rid of the old system and bring in the new, but she always wanted gender equality and women's suffrage. This was her thing. Sun Yat-sen knew it, but when they got into power, so she, she was like, okay, where's the gender equality? Where's the suffrage? And Sun Yat-sen was like, nah, maybe it's not quite time yet. <laughs> um, and she was so frustrated after a few, you know, attempts at civilized conversation about this. She got her girls and they, <laughs> they, they smashed the windows of the National Assembly. They kicked the guards to the ground <laughs> and they boxed the ears of some of the legislatures. It said in one of the local papers at the time that she had grabbed hold, I think she boxed the ears and twisted the beard 
of uh, some of the legislators with her delicate or dainty little hands. <laughs> doesn't sound that dainty. <laughs> but... Doesn't sound that dainty. And they still didn't get suffrage. And she ended up having to go back to her village and just, you know, but I love her. I think she's amazing. Um, <laughs> there's some others she, she as well. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I also really, really like the Tang poet, um, Xue Tao. I think she's such a beautiful poet. Um, she's so uh, Xue Tao was, she is well known if you know enough about Tang poetry, but I think often when we talk about the Tang poets, it's reduced to Li Bai and, and Du Fu and some of the more famous ones. But um, she was so clever and you read this stuff and it's so contemporary. Uh, can mm. I just read just a little bit of Of course, Xue Tao? please. Um, so this is um, uh, her, one of part of her 10 poems of separation, which I think are masterpieces of simplicity, wit and metaphor. Yes, she's a good dog, lived four or five years within his crimson gate, fur sweet smelling, feet quite clean, master affectionate. Then by chance she took a nip and bit a well-loved guest. Now she no longer sleeps upon his red silk rugs. <sighs> That is very contemporary. <laughs> so contemporary. It's so beautiful. So there's, you know, there's poets. Then when, and I would do things, I would make these choices like, okay, I want to profile chi China's ancient China, Han Dynasty um, through the Song Dynasty was so rich in invention. They invented everything, you know, from water clocks to obviously we've got the four great inventions that everybody knows about the printing press and that you know blah blah um but th there were so many interesting inventions like um a uh top the world's first topological map which was built with rice by general oh, wow. and things like that you know there was a a um what do you call those things that measure is it an odometer that measures the distance uh maybe <laughs> Yeah, I'm just something. Maybe that's not an odometer. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Just, yeah, it measures the distance. It <laughs> measures the distance, and it was this thing with with gongs and everything on a on the back of a cart, and it it, it there were these amazing inventions, and I thought, okay, I've got the inventions. Um, you know, I couldn't talk about all of them, and I wanted to profile say one or two inventors. So one of the inventors I profiled was the inventor of paper, and he was a eunuch. Um, mm -hmm. And he figured out how to press uh, mulberry bark and felt and all these other things into, into paper. Um, he would wet them and press them and do all this stuff. And he was a character, he got involved in some, um, in some intrigues, some palace intrigues. And that all went very wrong and he was handed a silk scarf to kill himself in the end. So he took a bath and, and he wrote a poem and he put on his nice silk robes and did himself in. Um, I know, uh, but then did. I thought, as you do, as many people had to <laughs> actually. Um, but then I thought, okay, can I find a woman inventor? And I did. And she's quite remarkable because she wasn't in the court, like the eunuch was actually a court official. She was nobody. She was a woman in a village who was in an abusive marriage with a terrible, terrible mother and uh, mother-in-law and father-in-law, who in the end, she just had to escape. So she ran away and she somehow, I don't know exactly how she thought of this, but she got on a boat and ended up on Hainan Island. Uh, and she was living with the Lee minority people for 23 years, she obviously missed her husband very much. Um, and and she, when she was down there, they were really, really good at all kinds of um, cotton dyeing and the making of cotton and all this stuff. So she learned all that from them, them, but then she began to invent on her own as well. And she created uh, these like machines for ginning and spinning and stuff that were incredible improvements on previous ones. She went back to her village after 23 years and she had these machines that she made and she taught other women how to use them. And that actually is the basis for the textile industry that grew up around Shanghai. Oh, wow. It's and a... she was, yeah, Huang Daopo. And apparently 
I've never been to it, but in Shanghai, there's, I will go next time. I just didn't realize it the last time I was there, but um, there's a little temple to Huang Daopo mm. in Shanghai because of her contribution. But she was, she really was a nobody. She was a village woman who just was smart and, and had the get up and go to get out of the marriage and, <laughs> and settle in with these, you can imagine, I, it's just so interesting to settle in with this ethnic minority Lee people and say, teach me what you know. Yeah. It's one of the things I really, really enjoyed about the book, actually, that kind of the spread of these women that keep popping up all throughout history. I mean, you know, you had your kind of Madame Mao that everyone knows about, but, you know, even even in the, the Shang, a, a martial warrior appears on the oracle bones. Um, and, you know, you keep, you keep seeing these powerful women pop up. And a lot of them did sort of go into battle. Um, yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, I think it's fair to say that also throughout history, uh, Chinese men, shall we say, had, had a bit of a woman problem. And, I mean, even in this, uh, the, the, it's the Han Empire, isn't it? Empress Lu the first instance of this phrase about women in power being as unnatural as a hen crowing at daybreak. Yes, it always was a bit of a problem. Um, and when, and, and, and you see that in the way that um, this other woman who I think everybody knows, Wu Zetian of the Tang Dynasty, uh, who founded her own little mini dynasty, which was in slight interregnum in the Tang. So it was pre her and after her. And she was very interesting. She was super smart. She was really capable. Um, she was quirky. <laughs> she, she, uh, she was no more power hungry or manipulative than any man who has ever sat on that throne. <laughs> but because she was, oh, she had lovers who were brothers. Um, because she had a few little, you know, personal peccadillas. She and she she ended up being a bit corrupt and nepotistic, like every male ruler, just about not everyone, but quite a few. Um, what, she's become this monster, you know. When you see representations of her in popular history, she is quite monstrous and cruel and and all this stuff. But you know, these she ruled no worse and a lot better than many a male emperor. Um, so there is a woman problem. And part of it is the way the histories have always been told. Part of it is the way popular culture, again, largely written by men, have passed these stories on through time. Uh, yes. And I mean, it, it persists even in the present as well. I mean, I, I think I'm right in saying this. No, well, really? <laughs> <laughs> of course. But, you know, in a, in a sort of, in theory, uh, in communism, the genders should be equal. Um, and yet there has never been a standing committee member of the Politburo who is a woman. Am I right in saying that? You're absolutely right. And I think there were some, um, there were some promotions this week. I was just checking it and I, I, I haven't read the whole story, but I think women have been promoted to big positions in Chengdu, <laughs> you know. Um, it's not, we're not even talking you know, really big positions. But I mean, that actually has made the news. It's kind of like saying Sydney has a female Lord Mayor. Great. We do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's not the same as saying that women are equal. The thing that's very interesting um, is the story behind Mao's famous phrase of women hold up half the sky. It wasn't about we want to give half the power to women. It, there, there wasn't even a consciousness of that, okay? Um, the May 4th movement had a very strong women's rights and women's equality theme to it. There were a lot of people who believed in that and that was a very important part of the May 4th, the 1919 May 4th movement um, whole thrust. But, and the communists did come out of that, but there were a lot more important things for the communists like power and how that, you know, an, an agrarian revolution and everything else. Um, so women's rights was always a part of the Communist Party's platform, but it wasn't a huge part of the way that they worked. 
And the reason that Mao said that, and I have this story in the book, um, is that when they were collectivizing land in the 1950s, um, they took all the land and then people were uh, organized into, into groups, into collectives to work the land, and people were given work points. So you would work the land and you would get your work points and those were worth certain things. I mean, it, it was your salary, but you might be paid in um, rice, for example, or grain or, or different di combination of things. So the women were getting paid much fewer work points than the men. And in one particular village, I think it was in Guizhou province, um, the, <laughs> the women were just going, yeah, whatever, I'm not going to come out and work. It's not worth it. And so the, the head of women's work then said to the village chief, you know, the problem is they're, they're earning so much less than the men. It's just not worth it for them to come out and work. And he's like, oh, and she said, if you gave them equal pay, maybe they'd all come out and work. So he said, OK, good idea. So they gave them equal pay and the women came out and worked and productivity went up in that village threefold. <laughs> not twofold <laughs> threefold and so Mao heard about this this was you know things are always reflected upwards and and Mao heard about this and he said women hold up half the sky so it was really in a sense it was not so much what can the revolution do for you but what can you do for the revolution <laughs> <laughs> to paraphrase uh, certain American president yes <laughs> Moving forward in history, um, I mean, you, you cover so much as we've discussed, but there is a point at which your own history sort of intersects because you were you were in China from the 80s onwards uh, or earlier even. I, no? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I went. Um, to, I was studying in Taiwan from 77 to 79. Then I moved to Hong Kong um, and I was in Hong Kong from 79 to 85, but I was always covering China for Asia Week magazine at the mm. time. Well, t tell us about what it was like then from if we can leave the book for a while and just talk about your own experience. Yeah. Well, it was fascinating. I mean, because Hong Kong was really changing then. There was the beginning of, there was the sense, every, every place was changing a bit. Uh, like the, in, Chiang Kai-shek had died, you know, in Taiwan and his son was there. It was still martial law, but it was beginning to be a little bit tiny little bit more free. Hong Kong was getting a little bit more uh, aware of its future and was being given a, a little teeny bit more self uh, direction. Um, things were changing. Um, I remember it was in 1982 that the the negotiations began over Hong Kong's future and I covered those negotiations. I was going up, I would cover them in Hong Kong and go up to Beijing when they were there. And that went on for two years. Um, and Hong Kong really, it was very interesting because China was opening up and it was, you know, it was post Mao, it was the beginning of the reform era. Um, it was the open door to the outside world. And people were really optimistic, including people in Hong Kong. People were a little bit worried, but they were also optimistic. And um, they were interested in China. And so there would be all these festivals in Hong Kong. There'd be festivals of old Shanghai movies. You know, I learned to sing every song by Bai Guang and Zhou Shen <laughs> before, because everybody was singing them, you know. Uh, there was this sense of real interest in it. There was a sense of positive uh, optimism. And so it was a very interesting time to be reporting on China when everything was opening up and changing and suddenly people, it was still, when I started reporting on China, it was still illegal for any person in China who didn't have authority to speak to a foreigner, to speak to a foreigner. You couldn't technically have friendships. But um, I mean, I had, a, <laughs> I had a secret boyfriend in Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you had, you, it was just a different thing. You just can't even imagine well, I suppose you can. <laughs> it really was very different. Um, it, there was a sense that people wanted to test the limits. 
And Deng Xiaoping would every so often come along with a big campaign and smack it down. And then people would begin to test again. And so I was meeting all of these people because also there were not that many foreigners and, and almost no foreign journalists who spoke Chinese and had studied Chinese history hanging out in China, you know? So it was really easy, almost shockingly easy for me to get to know people like, I, I got to know, say, Zhang Yimou and Chiang Kai-ge when they were making their first films. I've been you told know, I and, must ask you about that anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a pretty good one, actually. I'll tell that. <laughs> um, but I got to meet all these, I mean, I knew in, in Hong Kong, um, I would go to parties and there would be Chow Yun Fat. And he would, and, and Chow Yun Fat won, he probably doesn't remember this at all, but he wanted to practice his Mandarin. <laughs> so we would, <laughs> so, you know, it was so easy to get to know amazing people. And there were so many amazing people and there was so much excitement around that it was a very, the 80s were very, very special. And then of course, we all know how they ended. And I was in Beijing, then, so uh, I have, it, it divided my life in half. I mean, I was deeply, I had nightmares for a year and I didn't even see the massacre. But I'll tell you about Zhang, Zhang Yimou and Chiang Kai-ge. <laughs> you, were, you were with Billy Bragg in 1989 as well, weren't you? I was, you, you, yes. <laughs> you have a, a whole list of uh, <laughs> really fun name checks. <laughs> <laughs> name check, name check. Now, Billy, Billy, it was very funny because I remember that day I hadn't heard of him before, um, which is very funny because all my friends, in, when I got back to Australia, everybody's like, you what? <laughs> I was like, oh, I met, this, I met this really great guy. He's a singer from England. His name is Billy Bragg. They're like, what? <laughs> um, and I had been with the Australian cultural counselor um, and he said to me, oh, there's this English rock star coming. Uh, and um, his his manager is the brother of <laughs> Bill Jenner, who's a sinologist from Leeds, right? And so Bill has gotten in touch to say, would you look after Pete, his brother, and Bill? Um, and Nick goes, what do you reckon? And I said, yeah, sure. And, and we were going, oh, but what if he's like a really horrible rock star, like he throws televisions out of windows and it's going to be a complete nightmare in Beijing. And then, of course, we met Bill and it was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> And so I spent three days, you know, we went to the, we bought, we, but we bought matching Mao bus. <laughs> At one point he, we were walking through the markets and he goes, my bus is bigger than yours. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, oh, it was, it was great fun. We actually, but Bill and I were standing on the rostrum of Tiananmen, um, looking out and taking photos and doing the kind of Chairman Mao wave. Uh, and then Bill goes, what's going on in the square? <laughs> and we look and there's some people gathering in the square. And that was, so I met Bill on the Saturday when Hu Yaobam died. That was the Monday. And already the students were beginning to come into the square. And Bill said to me, what's going on? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. I'm just a China expert. I don't know. I don't know that it's actually one of the hugest you know, popular movements, the beginning of the of this huge popular movement that I'm, I'm witnessing, I had no idea. But do you want me to tell you about Zhang Yimou and Chiang Kai-ge? Uh, yes, yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an MTR story. Um, so I, <laughs> the MTR <clears throat> was relatively new at the time and I would take it to work, I, everybody, of course, you take it everywhere. And so I was sitting, and the funny thing is I normally read Chinese language novels uh, for my commute. Um, but on this day, for some reason, I was reading an English novel. Um, so I'm sitting there <clears throat> reading a novel and three people sit down across from me and I can tell they're mainlanders. And that was really unusual. It was like 1985, uh, five or six. Uh, it was very unusual to see mainlanders at the time. And they're speaking in this really beautiful Beijing dialect, which I love. And they started talking about um, film and they were talking about the Beijing, um, <clears throat> the Be they were talking about, you know, our Chang, our studio. And I'm thinking, hmm, and the Hong Kong Film Festival was just beginning. 
and they were going to be showing yellow earth and everybody was saying oh, yellow earth yellow earth this is going to be the most this is going to change the you know ah. it was a huge buzz around it and of course this was before social media it was before all this I, nobody had any idea what Zhang Yimou looked like or Chiang Kai Go looked like, you know. There's these two guys sitting with this woman and talking about film. I'm sitting there pretending to read my novel and listening in. And I finally couldn't take it any longer. And I said, uh, And they, they, <laughs> and they just went, <gasps> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm so shocked, you know, that this, this Wai Guoren was, was, speaking to them and I said are you from Beijing Film Studio and they were like yes <laughs> and I said oh I've heard that uh, Yellow Earth you know Yellow Earth is playing and I've heard that Chiang Kai Ge and Zhang Yimo from your studio are supposed to be here so uh do you know if they're going to be here because I would really love to meet them I'm a journalist and and they're looking at me like this and one of them went or her Chiang Kai Ge <laughs> and the other one went or her Zhang Yimou. <laughs> Amazing. You subtitled yeah. their, some of their films, didn't you? Yes, quite yeah. a few of Kai mm. Ge's and, and maybe three, I think, of Emo's. Yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> that's a uh, the, the really <laughs> classic MTR story, <laughs> except <laughs> rather more exciting than any of mine. <laughs> Um, if I can uh, uh, just uh, ask you about another uh, famous friend of yours and also uh, go back to uh, 1989, you, you, you wrote a whole book about your friendship with a, a pop star, uh, Ho De Jian. Um, yes. we, I just uh, wondered if you could talk us through that because that's another amazing story. <laughs> so Ho De Jian was the person who wrote Long De Chuan Ren. Um, in the 19, he wrote it in 1979. In the 1980s, it was the background music to everything. It was absolutely everywhere. And so I was fascinated by this song because it was, to me, people were singing it like an anthem and they would go to Victoria Park in the anti-Japanese textbook revisions protests and things like that. And they would all sing Lung De Chuan Ren. They would be like, ah, rah, rah. and I thought, but the words are kind of sad, you know? It I just occurred to me that it was quite interesting. I just was, I was fascinated by it. And then he came to Hong Kong um, and um, he was going to be playing at the Hong Kong Art Center. So I tried to get a ticket, but they were sold out. And then I heard that he was giving a talk at the, at the Hong Kong Art Center. And um, so I went and uh, I was the only um, Wai Guren in the audience. Everybody was Cantonese and there was a panel and they were asking questions. And he was talking in a way, because I'd lived in, Hong Kong, in Taiwan for two years. And I thought, oh my God, he's just like, I mean, he, he and I are going to be best friends. And then I thought, stop it. He's a famous person. You know, <laughs> you know it's kind of like, oh, Lizzo, she and I would be the best friends. <laughs> it's, kind of like, it's that kind of crazy thing, you know? And so I was sitting there going, but I was laughing at his jokes and no one else was because they didn't get the sense of humor or they didn't. They hadn't hooked into the language or something. So it'd be like, he would say something and I would be like, <laughs> and nobody else would be laughing. And so <laughs> he kind of would look up. Anyway, at the end, I thought, oh, I, I really feel like we could, I really feel close to this person, but then you're stupid, you're, he's a star, you know? Anyway, I, I was thinking, I starting to go forward, but all these people were flooding forward for his autograph and all this stuff. And I thought, oh, don't do it, don't do it, don't be stupid. And so I started to turn around and he went, yes, all. <laughs> don't go. <laughs> and he said, Gui Xi. And I went, I don't know what moved me. I just knew his sense of humor. I went, Gui Xi Jia, right? My humble surname is Jia. <laughs> and he burst out laughing and he was just like, you're not going anywhere. Anyway, we ended up talking for hours in the stairwell. And the next day he moved into my apartment, this famous singer <laughs> sleeping on the floor of my bedroom. Like, I didn't even have a spare room to offer him. He slept on the floor. <laughs> and, and then, of course, a couple years later, he defects to China. He just crosses over at a time when it was absolutely illegal. Um, and the Taiwan government 
uh, decided I'd done it and they banned me for seven years until he was sent back and clarified that I hadn't done it. Um, <laughs> but he, um, you know, it was, we had a very public friendship because once we met, he just took me everywhere with him. Um, and <laughs> we, so he goes to China and it was so shocking to Taiwan. It actually helped to force the whole identity debate into the open, even before martial law was lifted. Um, it was a galvanizing event for Taiwan identity and for the discussion of what that meant. It was really important for the mainland. He was the first person to hold a guitar and sing on TV in mainland China. Uh, he inspired lots of people with that kind of more natural style, which hadn't been there before, you know, which people there hadn't seen before. Um, and then he got involved because he's, he was irrepressible and he got involved with, uh, he was very good friends with Liu Xiaobo, the Nobel Prize, eventual Nobel Prize laureate who died in prison a couple of years ago, um, a very close friend. Um, and Liu Xiaobo got him hunger striking on Tiananmen Square. And then Hou Dejian kind of parlayed his fame into being able to talk to the soldiers and say, is at four in the morning on June the 4th when they've surrounded the square and there's still a couple thousand students in there and say to them, he jumped, he jumped out. He's like, I'm Hoda Jen, I'm Hoda Jen. And the soldiers are like, they're like, hey, I've seen him on TV. That's Hoda Jen. <laughs> it's nuts. He said he, his knees nearly melted. You know, he nearly fell over. He was so scared. Anyway, he managed to negotiate with, the, with them to give the students a time and a part of the square where they could evacuate. Otherwise, it would have been bloodshed all over the square. That's a possible outcome. So he saved thousands of lives. He went, I then, long story, but I ended up kind of sneaking him into the Australian embassy <laughs> with Nick Dose. And he took refuge there for about 70 days until the Chinese agreed not to arrest him when he came out. Mm -hmm. and and so yeah but then he continued they said you can't talk to the press he continued to talk to the press he couldn't shut up uh, he became the dissident of Beijing because everybody else was arrested or too scared to speak um very good reason and he figured with his privilege he'd always been given this great privilege as a Taiwan defector uh he had to pay back and so he spoke out he would call me every week when I was in Australia and say if I die in a car accident, it's not a car accident. You know that. I'm like, I know if you die, because we knew his phone was tapped. Right? <laughs> and we'd go through this ritual every week. Eventually, they got so sick of him. They took him, detained him, took him down to Fuzhou, put him on a boat, and literally caught a smuggling boat from Taiwan, <laughs> made him get on that boat, <clears throat> and told them to take him back. So I wrote The Monkey and the Dragon, which is now only available as an ebook, sadly, because I think it's a nice, it's got like, well, it still has the pictures in the ebook, but um, The Monkey and the Dragon is the story of, our friendship is the story of his life, of his father's life and mother's life. So how he came to be born on Taiwan, the son of two mainlanders. And it's a kind of a story of Taiwan and China. And that's, so amazing and also he knew everybody famous so I met Jet Li when he was 14 years old through Hoda Dan. <laughs> Jet Li would definitely not remember that one. <laughs> 100 um, percent. I'm afraid we're almost out of time. I only have time for one more question and then um, uh, one last cheeky one at the end. Um, so I, I guess going back to the book um, you say at the end the only way to learn from history is to learn history. Um, I mean, is that what, I mean, as Anthony mentioned at the beginning, you've had such a varied career, we've had a taste of it there. Is that, what, what drew you to write this enormous, like this enormous task? <laughs> well, two things, it's quite simple actually. I studied Chinese history at university and knowing, and having had four years of, of, of study at Brown University, great teachers, I thought I knew a lot about Chinese history. I didn't, but I had this idea one day, I'm going to write a popular history and tell everybody about this history, which I didn't actually understand at the time. <laughs> I still 
feel it's a work in progress. You know, you're always learning. Um, it's China's such a great subject for that. But what actually spurred me was the editor at Black Ink in Australia said to me, how would you like to write the shortest history of China? And I was like, oh my God, I've wanted to do this since I was a know nothing graduate <laughs> of university. Thank you, this is my dream. <laughs> That's uh, lovely. And speaking of books, um, you've got plenty behind you. We always ask all of our guests at the end of these sessions what they're reading um, at the moment, what you can recommend to our members. I'm on a bit of an African literature kick. Um, so, yes, I know it comes out of the blue, doesn't it? <laughs> but I would, I, I so recommend anything by Chigozi Obioma, The Fisherman, An Orchestra of Minorities. These are such beautiful books. I'm currently reading a Zambian writer. The book is called The Old Drift. And um, I'm going to say her name wrong, so I'm not going to say it. Just look up The Old Drift. <laughs> I've read The Old Drift of Minorities. It's, it's a wonderful book. Um, yeah. Isn't it great? It is fantastic. Yeah. And I've um, gone through all of Ch Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. <laughs> yes. Well, Linda, uh, Joven, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a wonderful hour with you. I wish we had longer. I had, I had double the questions, uh, <laughs> but we sadly didn't have time. Um, also, The Shortest History of China, it will be on sale soon. It, it's in, on sale in the UK from tomorrow? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And already on sale in Australia. I'm sure you can order it on Book Depository or something if you're in Hong Kong. Uh, so, Linda, good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. And please join us again sometime. Thank you, Rebecca. It's been a wonderful chat. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.